Welcome to another episode of Great War Story. This is a story of the Prussian Grenadiers. Sorry, I said Prussian Grenadiers, so I've got the wrong tune. Sorry, let me just kill the music. Yes, not the British Grenadiers, the Prussian Grenadiers. And I've called this episode Prussian Mule Rescue. And, uh, well, the guy who wrote the account and the soldiers involved seemed to think it was amusing. I know in my last episode... I called it a funny German joke, and the Germans who wrote about it thought it was amusing. Um, one of my subscribers said uh, he, he didn't see the joke, and, well, I guess it's, uh, you know, some humours don't translate very well, but, you know, what was it that um, Aitken said, in, that I mentioned in a previous episode, they've got German gallows humour, sort of a grim, dry sense of irony, perhaps. So let's get on with my story of the Prussian mule rescue. And this one comes from another one of these German language regimental histories. In this case, it is the Grenadier Regiment Graf Kleist von Nollendorf, the first West Prussians, number six. And uh, it's always nice when I can search around online and find some pictures to go with it. So we found the uh, battalion flag of the first battalion of the Graf Kleist von Nollenberg Prussians. And this book was published in 1935. You'll actually see that almost all of these German regiments have a history published either in the 1920s or the 1930s. There was quite a hunger for it. And if you study them, it's pretty obvious most of them are written to appeal to former members of the regiment or perhaps family members. Now, the first thing I wanted to know, of course, was where did the regiment get its name from? Who was this guy, Graf Kleist? Now, Graf back then, basically was like a noble title. Rough equivalent in English would be Count. So they were the Count Kleist von Nollendorf Regiment. And, uh, well, who was he? Well, he was a Prussian general who was alive in the 1700s to the 1800s, took part quite extensively in the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, one of the battles he took part in under General Blücher was the Battle of Léon. The only particular reason I mentioned that was because in my, well, my most recent previous episode, which I called a funny German joke, that just happened to occur just outside of Lyon. So that was an interesting coincidence for me. Uh, Blücher was the Prussian general who arrived at the end of the Battle of Waterloo and really turned the tide against Napoleon and 1814 Prussian troops were engaged against Napoleon and um, Maman, I think it was. And uh, they won what you'd call a tactical defensive victory. It wasn't an overwhelming victory, but they held the field and the French didn't. So you can give the credit to the Prussians on that one. And uh, for reasons I was not able to determine, in 1889, the Sixth Grenadiers were given his name. Now, in Cologne, there is a statue of the Prussian king, Frederick Wilhelm III, um, you see his dates there up to 1840. It's pre-German unification. And there's a whole bunch of famous Germans all um, around the side. Not all of them soldiers by any means. And uh, one of them is in fact our Graf Kleist von Nolenberg. Uh, sorry, not Nolenberg, Nolendorf. And there he is. Now I actually looked around trying to find a good photo of that particular individual. And... Uh, uh, in the end, I realized why I was having such difficulty getting anybody who would concentrate on that figure. Because if you look at the direction the uh, Prussian king is facing, it would mean you'd be taking a photo of the horse's rear end. Uh, most people, of course, want a sideways angle where they're going to get the, you know, the horse in profile or maybe from the front. Not that many tourists are going to be taking photos of the horse's rear end. So that was one of the reasons that I found it quite hard to get a close-up. And in the end, the best picture I found was this um, funny, well, not a funny website, just a website selling merchandise and so on. And it was on a mock-up of a mug. So, well, let's give them a bit of free advertising. This German web website, Alpha Shirt, no doubt you can go and get custom mugs from them. And uh, the one that they happen for whatever reason, or maybe pure coincidence, they just happened to be highlighting this uh, this general, Friedrich Graf Kleist von Nolendorf. And um, while I was looking for decent pictures, I thought I'd try Google Street View. And I noticed something really interesting, because I 
basically, you know, on street view, I walked around the statue trying to get a decent angle of him. That would be him there, not a very good angle. So I walked around it there and I noticed, hang on a second, what's going on here? Look, the whole thing's uncovered. And look, there's a truck there. And the truck seems to be covering everything and scaffolding and all of the rest. And then, oh, what do we have here? There's no king. The rest of them are boarded up. Now, you know, given recent history in the United States where they've been removing statues all over the place. In fact, I believe that um, spread to elsewhere to the extent that in Hamilton in New Zealand, they even took down the statue of Hamilton, which seems a bit strange considering the whole city is named after him. But whatever, it was a, something that seemed to be raging across the Western world to take down statues. So I thought, oh dear, was it some sort of anti-militarism thing that made them take down the statue of the Prussian king? Um, turns out I was completely wrong. And you have to be careful about jumping to conclusions. And I learned this when I went to a Cologne tourism website. And it's the second paragraph that gives us the key. The statue was dedicated by representatives of the citizenry of Cologne in September of 1878. In October 2009, the equestrian statue was returned to its place on the Hoymarkt after lengthy restoration work. So what I was seeing on Google Street View on these differently timed photos, I actually misinterpreted it and saw it in reverse. What was actually happening was the horseman was actually being put back up. He wasn't being removed at all. And one other thing I found, it uh, eventually I found, stumbled on this one, but it was a really interesting website, Statues Hither and Thither. And this particular link that's on the screen was the guy who did a complete analysis of all of the individuals. Um, there are also some bronze panels showing some different battle scenes and things like this. And he goes through and systematically breaks down every single piece of this um, quite complicated memorial. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, it rings your bell. Well, you might like to go and check that one out. Now, the book that gave me the information, as I already told you, Das Grenadier Regiment Graf Kleist von Nollendorf, the first West Prussians. Now, the author was Doring von Gottberg. I believe it's Franz Doring von Gottberg. And I wanted to learn more about who he was, but frankly, couldn't find much. I could find that he wrote a number of other German military histories. Many of the other ones I've got were written by members of the regiment, survivors and things like this. This guy seems to have perhaps been more of a professional historian. At least he wrote a number of military histories. And I couldn't even be sure of his exact dates. I think I identified him correctly, but even the death date was not sure. Was it 1940? Was it 1945? I wasn't able to determine. And of course, it would be nice to get a sense of what our Prussian grenadiers looked like. And on this Great War Postcards website, I managed to find a copy of this postcard from March of 1916. And look at them. Look, at they're all sporting, well, not quite all of them, but great moustaches. That was clearly the, you know, the fashion of the age, and the majority of them have moustaches of one degree or another. Yet you see it quite a lot with a lot of the British troops as well. I guess that's a fashion that um, isn't going to come back soon, but well, who knows? Um, now, tracking the history of this regiment, they were not like my last episode where they'd been on the Eastern Front for much of the war. These guys had been on the Western Front for the whole of the war. They were and the initial attack on France in 1914, and in 1916 they were at Verdun. So given this postcard is March 1916, and they're going to experience the mass casualties of Verdun, I can't help wondering when I look at that photo how many men survived to the end of the war. Now, let's read back some of the background to explain why the mule rescue was so dramatic. So this is from this grand assault the Kaiserschlacht, the Spring Offensive of March 1918. And let's read back a few paragraphs before the episode that interests me. The defense of the invisible enemy, hidden by the fog, becomes stronger and stronger. So what's going on here is there's very heavy fog in the mornings. On the 21st, when the Germans first attack, 
they were greatly assisted by the dense fog. So as they were approaching the British trenches, even the survivors of the mass artillery assault uh, couldn't really see them until they were almost on top of them. That really helped them break through the British first and second lines. But of course, fog in that sense is neutral. It doesn't help anybody more than the other. So as they're approaching the Crozat Canal, there's a dense fog. They can't really see where the enemy are. So let's get back to it. The defense of the invisible enemy, hidden by the fog, becomes stronger and stronger. Our companies laboriously work their way through bushes and ditches. Finally, it clears up a bit, and they manage to get themselves somewhat oriented. But if they show themselves even a little bit, it means almost certain death. The English shoot very well. Now, let's get the bigger context. Die Große Schlacht in Frankreich, March 1918. So, the Great Attack in France, March of 1918. Now, what has particularly interested me is the death of my great-uncle. He was with the 11th Royal Fusiliers, just to the right of the village of Jussi. So, you can see where I put the X there. That's where the 11th Fusiliers were trying to hold the canal. But, I've already said that I... In my research, well, if you want to learn about that, go back and watch my episode, No Known Grave. And I talk a lot about how the Fusiliers were overrun. So that was, um, now, my Prussian Grenadiers, they are with the German 10th Division. If you look at the line here, the plan was for them to strike the canal just a little bit to the left of the village of Jussi, while the Fusiliers were holding the right flank. In the end, they actually ended up going in a little bit further right than the original plan called for because, you know, as there's mass numbers of divisions advancing, they're all kind of running into each other and, well, the advance doesn't work 100% according to plan. And um, then we have here my attempt to look at the terrain across, across which they were attacking. So I, again, using Google Street View, I walk down what's almost just a farm track, a very narrow little road. You can see um, up on the water tower, it actually says Jussi. I'm just on the German side of the canal, just a little bit northwest of the village. And the canal itself would be behind that line of trees in the distance. So you can see as they approached the canal, it was very open, flat countryside. Let's carry on. Weiss Feldwebel Fruhauf of the 9th Company, who, as it turns out later, was promoted to become an officer on March 22nd, was badly wounded right at the beginning. Lieutenant Buchner, Wolfram, and Lieutenant Kasparite, Alfred, of the 10th Company, fall dead. Lieutenant Latterman suffers a serious head wound. From just the 9th Company alone, 17 men are put out of action here on the canal. It's brutal and dangerous. There's British artillery. There's British machine gun fire, uh, rifle fire, of course. It's dangerous, and the Germans are suffering heavy casualties. If you again watch my previous episode, I actually discuss this rank, Weiss Feldwebel. Uh, so I won't talk about that again here. I lie for a long time, writes the leader of this company, Lieutenant Kraft, next to Lieutenant Latterman in a small hollow behind a barn, which is a special target for the enemy machine gun. After crawling around for hours, I managed to find out about the situation in my company. Fortunately, I found them in a ditch 50 meters ahead, which offered them some protection and the possibility of forming a skirmish line. Then, as heavy English artillery fire sets in, I crawl to the battalion staff behind the stone wall of a paddock. And this photo comes from their regimental history. It's not super high quality, but you can see there it actually says this is the regimental staff in the Great Offensive. So those are some of the individuals who are being referred to in this passage. Back to the account of the 1st Battalion. As on the previous day, the sun had parted the fog here in the late morning. Gorgeous sunshine lay over the landscape. The battalion had explored a crossing point about 300 metres southwest of Kama, which seemed to be favourable, because the opposite bank was a little too high and so steep that the crossing point probably had to be in a blind spot at times, so maybe they'd be able to get across 
without getting having a hail of British machine gun fire hit them. And this photo here from the same regimental history, actually the Ubergang, the crossing over the Crozat Canal on the 23rd. So this photo was taken after they'd successfully cleared the British defenders, but it shows you the canal itself wasn't terribly wide, but it was, well, it was quite deep and represented an impassable obstacle as long as the British were defending it. But once you could clear the defenders away and get some well, not even really need pontoon bridges, as you can see, just a few planks across, then they could cross relatively easily. Now, as I followed that farm track on Google Street View, this was the farthest you could go down that little road. It, the Google truck obviously couldn't go any further. But I've studied the trench maps, and I studied exactly where I was on Google Maps, and I, while I can't prove it definitively, I think this very well may be Kamar Farm, the one that this German account mentions. And the view, now this is just me rotating from that exact same position, the farm is off to my right, I rotate left and I look towards the street line, and again the canal would be just behind that line of trees, so this would be the exact area which um, is being described. Now here we have the village of Jussi, this is one of these trench maps, you can actually get all these trench maps for free and downloadable from the National Museum, um, National Library of Scotland. I don't know why they're the ones who have it, but that's where you go to get them. So in my story of my great uncle, which is the focus of this part of my research, that's the area just to the right of Jussi, just between Jussi and that railway bridge, because that was the section of the front that was given to the 11th Fusiliers to hold. And I've already talked a bit in that previous episode about the German assaults that were coming straight at them. I also mentioned uh, the account of Captain von Schobert, who led an assault across the bridge and charged down the main street of Jussi. So that's where von Schobert would have attacked. So even if the 11th Fusiliers had managed to hold their front, well, their left flank had already been turned by the successful assault down the main street of Jussi. But I wanted to extend my research and see what was going on just a little bit further up the canal. And this is where the Prussian grenadiers were attacking. That's the area around Kamar Farm. That's the section of the canal that they were assaulting. Now, again, you can see a little bit further northwest moving up that map. You can see on the bottom right, there's where the 11th Fusiliers were holding Jussi at the bottom now. And you can see there Kamar Farm right up in the uh, top left. And also, I wanted to go and see and get the accounts of the different British defenders to see what was going on. And I was able to identify the 5th Lancers, the 8th Rifles, and the 7th Somerset Light Rifles, or Somerset Light Infantry, the SLI. So, that's the area to the southwest of Kamar Farm that the Germans are assaulting during this particular episode that I'm well, I'm dealing with in today's ep my own episode. Now, what's particularly interesting for me about the presence of the SLI, the Somerset Light Infantry, the 7th Somerset Light Infantry, this fellow on the left is my grandfather. Now, every episode that I've been talking about, except these ones relating to the Fusiliers, well, these relate to my great uncle, my grandmother's brother, but my whole research project and almost every other episode that you'll see 28 or and still growing is related to my mother's father my grandfather on the maternal side now up until now i've never mentioned the fact that my paternal grandfather was also in world war one there he is he's a corporal you can see on his shoulder he has a badge as a lewis gunner and um the the regimental insignia on his shoulder at the moment shows dorset light infantry at uh, the, Dor the dorsets but he was actually in the um, 7th Somersets at other stages of World War I. Now, unfortunately, his record was lost. He was one of those British World War I soldiers whose military file was lost in the German Blitz in World War II, and I've been able to learn very little about him, and I would love to know if he was present with the 7th Somersets in March of 1918, in which case I had relatives from both sides of my family, on my mother's mother's brother, who was with the 11th Fusiliers and died down there on the bottom right of this map, 
it's quite possible that my paternal grandfather was also defending the canal just a few miles up the road um, on this stretch of the Crozet Canal. But sadly, I can't actually even get to the basic point of determining when he joined the 7th SLI and when he left the 7th SLI. So I can't prove it one way or the other, but it's a definite possibility. Okay, returning to my story. The troops also succeeded in some places to get to the canal, and the company of the 5th Pioneers assigned to the regiment immediately proceeded with great determination to cross on rafts and individual planks. But all attempts failed. The enemy dominated the canal area only too well with his excellently placed machine guns. So it was said, for better or worse, that the 1st Battalion would wait for the protective darkness of the night. The staff of the regiment and F Battalion had moved their combat post near the canal into a fenced enclosure with a low earthen cover. Here, Lieutenant Klumpt witnessed the following daredevil caper. Now, I had a lot of difficulty translating this word. The German word was Streichus. But what does it mean? Uh, the various definitions that the... I tried more than one German-English dictionary. The various translations I got was a prank, like you could play a trick or a prank on your teacher in the classroom. That It, it would be used in that kind of context. So should I go with caper? Should I go with prank? Should I go with trick? Frankly, my German isn't good enough to quite get the flavor exactly right. But clearly, the context and the, well, you're getting the general sense of the word, is that they found it quite amusing or funny or ridiculous what was going on. So, here Lieutenant Klumpt witnessed the following daredevil caper. Three mules are grazing in a paddock of the homestead. One of my men... The young NCO Heinze sees them, walks over to bring two under cover from the fire of the enemy, but the third runs off and gallops around in the paddock. Heinze is after it, grasps it, jumps up on it, but the animal rears and he falls. We watch all this and believe that he's wounded, because at the same time the mule is hit and collapses, but Heinze jumps up and comes running back to his rifle position. Um... And this is why I gave you all that earlier context of just how dangerous the position was, how there was British machine gun fire, artillery fire dropping all around them. And here's this German NCO who just sees these three mules wandering around in a field and goes, yeah, I think I'm going to walk out there amidst this hail of lead and shrapnel, and I'm just going to bring those mules in. The photo at the top, by the way, is actually from Gallipoli, but, you know, it is a mule being led through Gallipoli, so I thought it kind of fit the story. Let's carry on. Of course, he must be formally reprimanded for his unbelievable recklessness. However, the machine gun company now has two mules that will serve them well for a long time. So, well, he got away with it. He rescued two of the mules. The other one got hit. He put himself in, well, took suicidal risks to recover them. And yes, I do know that this is not a mule. This is a horse. But it seemed like a pretty close matchup to what was being described in the story. And uh, this picture that I led with in my opening screen does actually come from a different episode in the same regimental history, but again showing British artillery fire hitting them and horses rearing and panicking, and I think those are probably supposed to be British planes in the background on the top right. And as I said, I'm trying to keep these short, a few interesting little episodes that stood out to me as kind of interesting. But before I say good evening to you, you may be wondering, if you've start, only recently started to watch my episodes, why I always finish every episode with the same picture. Good evening, have you realized what pleasure you're missing when you don't own a radio? I explain all that in a previous episode called When the War is Over, What Then? About what my grandfather did when he went back to New Zealand. And this actually comes from a newspaper advertisement that he placed in a Wellington newspaper. So that's the direct connection to um, my family history and why I decided I would go with this picture as my final, you know, goodbye thing for every episode. So on that note, I'm going to say to you, good evening. <laughs>